Sometimes you see that and, and people have to, to treat their children that way or treat family members that way. Sometimes it has to happen that way, in that way. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, and I think that's what's happening in our society today, that's what God's done to us as he's letting us have our way. Ultimately, our way leads to destruction. God's way leads to life and salvation. The, the human way leads to destruction and damnation. Brothers and sisters, he is allowing us in the society that we live in today to have our way. And Satan is wreaking havoc in the lives of people all around. And one thing that I want to bring out, and I want us to consider this, is that in doing so, as you watch that degradation as it falls into homosexuality and transgenderism and all this debased kind of uh, sexual uh, sin is going on around us, do you know what the purpose of all of that is? The purpose of all of this is destroy the image of God that, that human beings were created in. Satan wants nothing more than to destroy that image. And if people give themselves over to this sin and do these terrible things and behave in these manners, they're destroying, they're defacing, they're mocking the fact that human beings are created in the image of God. So one more time, are people cursing at God because he's allowed them to have their own way and to do things the way they want to do it. That's the society that we live in. But as we go into the next chapter, Paul's going to take all of this instruction that he's given in the first chapter, talking about the pagan world, and he's going to turn it on its ear and make people start looking at themselves. So let's take a look at what he has to say in chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, he says, You, therefore... So the church that he's writing to have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now I titled this first section, I don't do that. So whenever you look at this, just consider for a moment. Whenever you read that first verse, chapter 2, verse 1, when you read that, he says, you do the same things, and then go back and read the first chapter. And I don't do that. How about you? But we have to consider it from this point of view. As Jesus was going through the Sermon on the Mount, which we have gone through in great detail, what did he talk about sin? If you were angry with a brother, right? It is the same as if you had committed murder. So, and you may not have committed the act of murder, you may not have struck them physically, but because of the hatred you have in your heart for them, it is the same as if you had done it. Okay? So, whenever you carry within yourself the, the sin of lust, and it, and it comes in your thoughts, and it's, it's a part of what you're doing, he's saying that if you're dwelling on that in your heart, you're doing the same thing that these other people have done when you allow lust to run rampant. Whenever you uh, steal things, you're, you're allowing that to run rampant. Whenever you hate people, you're allowing hatred and murder to run rampant in your heart. When you're doing those things, you may not have performed the act, but the sin is the same. As they say, when you point a finger at somebody else, you got three pointing back at yourself, right? And that's what he wants people to understand. He wants people to see the truth of what's going on here is that none of us are perfect. None of us are without sin. None of us can get to heaven without Jesus. Now, he's not going to talk about the way of salvation until we get into chapter 3. So right now, he's still trying to make the point for them to understand that although these sins are right out there in the world and you can see all this stuff that's going on just like we can today, you can go out there and you can look around and you can see how people are living their lives and you can think, that's a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin, that's a sin. But brothers and sisters, what they're doing is they're worshiping self, or they're putting self before God. What do we do in our lives? Do we put ourselves before God? If we put ourselves before God, we're doing the exact same thing. It's no different. Consider that for a moment. Whenever God asks you to do something, whenever God moves upon your heart or your mind, to, to, to perform some task, to, to, to pray for somebody, to study the Bible, to, to go out and to witness, whenever God is moving upon you and you decide, yeah, I don't feel like it. Have you put yourself before God? 
whenever you come to this place where you realize that uh, God may have a job for you to do. He may want you to serve in a ministry in the church. He may want you to, to volunteer at, uh, at a, a homeless uh, camp, a shelter or camp and distribute food to people. He may want you to just talk to somebody. Whatever it is that God's moving upon you to do, whenever you say, I don't feel like it. I don't have time. I'm busy. Whenever you do that, are you putting yourself in front of God? You absolutely are. And so if you're putting self in front of God, that is the basis for the same sin that he was talking about in the first chapter. So brothers and sisters, it's real easy to point a finger at somebody and say that their lifestyle is sinful. But brothers and sisters, we got to do some checking of ourselves before we start pointing fingers, right? we got to deal with the, the beam in our own eye before we can pick the moat out of somebody else's, right? So if that's the case, what Paul's wanting them to understand, because there's a lot of people, whenever he was writing this letter to the church, there's a lot of Jewish uh, Christians that were in this time, at this time. And it was real easy for them to judge the Gentiles. But what he's saying is, is because of the knowledge that you have to the, this Jewish church that he's writing to, because of the knowledge that you have of the scriptures, because of the knowledge of the commandments of God, much more is going to be required of you than of them. They had a natural revelation about who God is, and they rejected that and went their own way, and they're condemned for it. You had a special revelation in that you had the scriptures, you had the presence of God, you had the temple and the tabernacle, you had everything given to you, and you still rejected him. And because of that, your punishment is going to be just as bad as theirs, if not greater. Brothers and sisters, as I've said, the Holy Spirit wrote this letter through the Apostle Paul to a specific church at a specific time for a specific reason. But because the Holy Spirit had him write these words, he is speaking to us today. Amen. It is easy for us to point to our society and to point out all of the sickness and all of the ills that's there. But brothers and sisters, we've got to deal with what's going wrong in the church first. We have to deal it because we have the revelation. We have the knowledge. We know about Jesus and we know what he's done. And I got to ask you, are you taking for granted the fact that you can ask for forgiveness? We touched on this in our Sunday school class this morning and I was trying to not get too out of hand because I knew I was going to be preaching about it. But I wanted to deal with this idea that whenever we come to this place where we think that we're above somebody else because we're not doing this sin or that sin, Brothers and sisters, sometimes we're doing that same thing right here. We just haven't performed the act yet. But because we know Jesus, we think I can just go and ask forgiveness for this. His grace will wash over me and cleanse me of this. That is a true statement. But what does God look at? He looks at the overall direction of your life. Are you progressing and getting closer to him? Or are you using his grace and his excuse to do whatever you want to and you still actually have got self on the throne of your heart? Are you worshiping yourself and doing what you want to do? Or are you worshiping God and doing what he's telling you to do? There's a distinction that has to be made there. There's a lot of people in the church today, and I'm talking about everywhere, that really want to live for themselves. They want to do what they think is right. They want to take it and turn scripture and to make it say what they think it ought to say. I've heard people talk about, <laughs> it's really easy to get mad whenever you're paying attention to the internet. <laughs> but I've heard people use the term Stone Age moral philosophy in re reference to the gospel. The Stone Age, seriously? That's just stupid. But what it is, it's an utter rejection of the things of God. The utter rejection of the idea that there is an absolute moral line that can't be crossed. God has laid down a foundation for us. And whenever God says it to be true, it is true. Now, this rejection of this, if you don't think that this fits, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really float today. It's, it's not the thing that's, it's not cool today. It's not with what everyone thinks today. Well, the reason it's not is because everybody's living in sin. And absolutely, sin is not going to line up with what God says. That's the, by its very nature, it can't. So instead of lining up with the Word of God, instead of changing sinful lives and sinful attitudes, people want to try to change the Word of God to line up with what they want. And what are they doing? 
worshiping self in the process. Brothers and sisters, we can't allow that to happen. We can't allow it to happen in our church. We can't allow it to happen in as much as we can in our families and our society. But the best thing that we can do, we're not going to fight. We're not going to argue with people. What we're going to do is we're going to pray. Because right now, I can tell you that everyone that is in that way has been blinded by Satan. Satan has got their eyes so blinded that they cannot see truth if it was slapping them in the face. They couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And the only way that that blindness gets removed, the only way those eyes are open, the only way truth becomes known is if the Holy Spirit of God reveals that to them. And the only way that happens, brothers and sisters, is we're praying for people. Amen. We're praying for God to intervene for them. We're praying for God to change their lives. We're praying for God to open their eyes. We're praying for God to set them free from whatever stronghold the enemy has placed on them. Amen. Are we praying? Are we praying for people? Now, we know that God's judgment, verse 2, is against those who do such things is based on truth. Whenever God judges somebody and he puts them there, it's absolutely true. There's no question about it. God knows what's going on. The thing about it is, is a lot of people think they're all right. A lot of people in the church think that they're okay because they're not doing what somebody else is doing. So if I measure myself against somebody else in the church, if I measure myself against Andy, and say, well, because Andy's doing this, and I'm not, I'm better than him, or if we vice versa that, that's not right, because he is not my measure. I am not his. God is the measure for both of us. Brothers and sisters, you want to compare your life to somebody, compare your life to Christ. You want to try to measure up, measure up to him. Don't try to measure up to me. Don't try to measure up to anybody in this world or a TV minister or anything else. You measure to Jesus. He is the only standard that we have to live by. That's the only thing that we need to be paying attention to. So when you, in verse 3, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, those people that he was talking about in chapter 1, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? This idea that we can get by with this is a sickness that we have. And a lot of times it comes because we like to change terminology. Let's take, for instance, this. Someone we might look at and say, well, they're a liar. But whenever you tell a lie, you're not lying. You're simply stretching the truth. Anybody in here ever stretched the truth a little? You know, just a little white lie really didn't hurt anybody. Still a lie, right? How about if you steal something? So somebody steals something, you point at them and say, they're a thief. But you might borrow something from somebody without asking, right? Turn of phrase, point of view, how you look at it. While other people may be prejudiced, you simply have strong convictions. Others are cheating, you're just bending the rules a little bit. Others lose their temper, but you have a righteous anger. Others have a critical spirit, and we are simply being blunt when we tell the truth. Others gossip, and we just share prayer needs. Brothers and sisters, think about this. Because I know that we've all heard people say things of that nature. It doesn't matter whatever terms you want to put it in. The truth of the matter is this. Sin is sin. Amen. No matter who commits it, sin is sin. And whether it's a little bitty sin, a little white lie, or a great big lie, whatever that is, whatever it is, it's still a lie in God's eyes and still sin in God's eyes to separate you from God. Now, we know today, and we ought to take it for granted, that we have Jesus. And because we have Jesus, His blood cleanses us from all sin, and His grace is there for us to lean into whenever we're struggling. But do not ever let that become an excuse for you to do things the way that you want to do instead of the way things He says. It makes a difference in how we live. So, whenever we consider all of this and we look at it, if we're all condemned, what's the point? Everyone's condemned in the eyes of God. Everyone's condemned because everyone has sinned. Even those of us that think we're okay, whether it was the Jews who thought they were okay simply because they were Jews, or it's the church today that thinks we're okay simply because we're the church. Whatever it is, what's the point? The point is this. And this is where Paul wants to get them to as he's bringing them through this entire process because he's not ever been there to teach this church. He wants to walk them through step by step so that they understand 
all of the thinking that goes into what's going on and the grace and the riches that we have in Jesus. So in verse 4 he says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Now because God's condemnation and his wrath in the form of destruction doesn't fall on people that commit sin, a lot of people think that they're okay. Brothers and sisters, whenever the God doesn't strike with lightning the people that are committing sin in the world out there, we think, wow, how come God didn't strike them with lightning? The same reason that he doesn't strike us with lightning when we commit sin here. Because of his love and his kindness and his forbearance, his patience with us. Because of that. Or he would do like he did Ananias and Sapphira and strike us down immediately. Now, how many of us would want to join the church if every time you come in, you had some, you walked in the door and God was there to judge you as you walked in the door about whether you had sin in your life. If you walked in, you had sin in your life and he struck you dead when you walked in the door. How many of us would be walking through the door today? Think about it. But because of his kindness, because of his love, he holds back that hand of justice. And because he holds it back, we get in our heads that we must be all right. We must be okay. Paul warns, don't take that for granted. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are, get this, storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Think about that for a moment. You, because of your stubbornness, because of your refusal to admit that you have an issue, that you have a problem, whether you're here or there, whether you're in the church or out of the church, whenever you stubbornly refuse to admit you have a problem, what are you doing? You are storing up for yourself. Just think about that, that there's a storeroom somewhere that God is putting all of the wrath that he's going to pour out on you one of these days, and he's just filling it up. There's a, got another box of wrath full. I'm just going to put it in this room right over here. I may have to get a bigger room for this guy because it's waiting for that day of judgment. And when that day of judgment comes, he's like, okay, empty the wrath. Pour it out all on him right there. There he is. See, whenever you're looking at that, when you're considering that, we know that there's only one place that we can go. And we keep going there because we already know that. We've got this wonderful gift of living 2,000 years after this letter was written to know all about Jesus and all about his grace and his mercy. But brothers and sisters, the warning comes to the church just as it came to the Jews. Be careful that you're not using that as an excuse. Because we can be storing up wrath for ourselves in the same manner. Because if the general direction of our life is not towards God but towards self, we're fooling ourselves. And we're taking ourselves on our own path to receive the wrath of God directly. Now think about this for a moment. Why does God do this? Why does he withhold that and let it store up and build? It's for this reason. Whenever you go back and you look at uh, it's Luke 15, I think it is, where the, the parable of the prodigal son is. As the prodigal took all of the wealth and he went and he squandered it and he was all away from his family and friends. He didn't know anybody. All of his supposed friends that he got from his money and, and spending this extravagant wealth, they all left him whenever he became penniless. He was in the, the sty with the pigs, thinking about eating the, the slop that they were feeding to the pigs because he was so hungry and so destitute. What made him want to go back to the father? Was it his father's wrath? Was it his father's anger? Or was it his father's love? He wanted to go back home because he knew how good his father was to even the servants. And because he was so good to those servants, he knew he didn't deserve to be a son anymore, but he would be willing to be a servant in that household because it would be so much better than what it was where he had gone the way that he wanted to go. Brothers and sisters, it's the same way for us. Our Father in heaven is waiting for us with love to turn back to him and to get our hearts right with him. 
Brothers and sisters, you want the power of God to flow in your life. You want to have the Holy Spirit moving through you. You want to, you want to know what that's like to feel that and through every fiber of your being. You have to surrender your heart completely to God. And you have to do the things that he asks you to do. He will give you little tasks to begin to stretch you, to begin to move you. Whatever those tasks are, if you are faithful in doing those things, then those tasks will gradually become greater as he stretches you and moves you and makes more room for himself to come through your life to be a witness to other people. But you have to be fully surrendered. His love, his grace, and his mercy is absolutely there. It absolutely is. But he wants the people that are surrendered to him. He wants the people that come to him and that there's a reciprocal love, that you love him, he loves you, and this love back and forth between you becomes this connection where the power of God can flow through you. That's what he's looking for. That's what he wants for his people. And it sounds really good when I'm standing here talking about it, right? But when we go out into the world next week, say Tuesday afternoon, and things aren't going well for you, the car broke down. There was an extra fee at the bank, and you don't have the money to fix it. And what happens? Are we praising God? Or are we having a little cussing fit? Come on, fellas, ladies. What are we doing whenever everything seems to be falling apart in the world out there? Are we turning to God? Are we giving him our full heart? Are we asking him, what are you trying to teach me in this, Lord? I'm ready for whatever lesson it is that you have for me. Maybe there's someone here that I need to speak to. What, what are you looking for the opportunity that God may be opening for you? Or are you mad because of your circumstances? You got that your, your, your face changes, that becomes a face of wrath, and nobody wants to be near you, and nobody wants to talk to you because everything's going bad. You're just having a bad day. How are we handling it? If we handle it God's way, what will we be doing? Saying, okay, Lord, I need you to help me out here. And just surrender ourselves to him and say, okay, what is it that we need? Okay, I'll have to call somebody. I'll just have to start looking and seeing and see what avenues and opportunities God opens up for you there. Or we do it our way. We have a fit. We get mad. We can't get, our families don't want to be around us. Uh, nobody walking down the street wants to be around us. They give you a wide berth. Nobody wants to talk to you. And you absolutely are not having a witness for God. How are we handling our circumstances on a day-to-day -day basis? It's got to be more than talking about the love of God here. It's got to be the love of God every day of our lives. It's got to be the love of God every moment of our lives. It's got to be the love of God when we're driving down the road and somebody cuts right in front of you with their car and then slows down. It's got to be the love of God whenever you got to go to Walmart. And for some reason, they want you to check yourself out like you're the star employee. It's got to be the love of God in every circumstance. And I'm sorry, but that is one of my pet peeves. I don't work at Walmart. I don't want to run the checkout. They have employees for that. That's why we pay those prices they have for groceries. Okay, so all of this, your stubborn and unrepentant heart, all that storing up wrath. Brothers and sisters, whenever you think about that and you think about all the wrong that you've done and you consider how much wrath may be in storage in heaven waiting to pour out on you, and then you think Jesus took every bit of that wrath that was stored up for every human being, for everyone who is willing to come to him and surrender their life and ask for forgiveness of sins, all of that wrath was poured on him. And he carried that. He bore up under that and accepted the wrath of his father when he deserved none of it. But when you think about that, tell me that doesn't stir your heart. Because if it doesn't stir your heart, I'm going to ask you to check your salvation. If it does stir your heart, Ask yourself, have you fully surrendered to him? Because he carried that for you. Because he did that for you. How much do you owe him? You're never going to pay it. You're never going to be able to earn it. He did it out of love. But can you love him back by serving him? Ask yourself that. What we do in this life matters. <clears throat> Romans 2.6 God will repay each person according to what they have done. Now, I want to make this clear. 
This is not talking about salvational things. We are not earning salvation. He is talking about sin and judgment. Okay? We've not gotten to the salvation part yet. We're talking about sin and judgment. So God will repay each person according to what they have done. That is the basis for judgment. Our lives that we live here, when we stand before the judgment throne, after we die and we appear before the judgment throne, God is going to judge you by what you have done. And a lot of people have got it in their heads that if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, I'm going to be okay. That's not how it works. It's going to be, have you ever done a bad deed? Okay, you're out of here. One bad deed is all it takes. The least little bit of sin, the tiniest little dot of sin is enough to keep you out of heaven because only heaven allows per heaven only allows perfection. That is why we need Jesus, because he was our perfection for us. He gave us his righteousness whenever he took our wrath on the cross. He said, I will bear the penalty of the wrath that is due you, and I will give to you the righteousness that's going to get you into heaven. Brothers and sisters, that is not a fair exchange. <coughs> That's why we say we could never deserve it. We could never earn it. There's nothing we could ever do. No matter how good we are, no matter how many times that we jump up in the middle of the night whenever God says, I need you to pray for somebody. Whenever you get up in the middle of the night and you are diligent in prayer until your knees start looking with, they're all calloused and, and you got dents more on the floor where you fall down on your knees to pray and, and you, you stay awake and you pray for hours for that person or that situation that God has moved you to pray for. Or you speak to every person you walk down the street, everyone where the Spirit moves on your heart to say, tell them something about me, tell them about my love, tell them about my grace. And you should do it every single time and you never once miss. There will be at some point where you have the thought of something sinful, something that is not according to God's will. And that is enough, brothers and sisters, to keep you out. You cannot be perfect enough. As a human being, you cannot be perfect enough. But Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, took on the form of a human being, became flesh, and he carried that for you. He did live a perfect life in every circumstance and situation, and he has granted you that perfect life when you receive him as Lord and Savior. And because it was perfect, it's good for all of us. Because he was God's son, it goes forever. For as many as will come to him, his blood washes away all sin. But brothers and sisters, do not let that be a license for you to live for self instead of living for God. That was the difference, and that's what a lot of people don't get today. We count on grace, and we take it for granted instead of realizing that we still need to live for God. What we do, how we live, matters. That's what Paul's trying to get them to understand. He wants them to make it clear that knowing good is not enough. You have to do good. Those who by persistence in doing good seek Glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Those who by persistence in doing good, they seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give them eternal life. Right? That's the basis of judgment. When you persist in it and you keep striving for it, even if you don't quite make it, but that's what you're reaching for. But those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. In verses 9 and 10, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, and then for the Gentile. It's a matter of degrees is what he's talking about here. He wants them to understand everything that he's brought up to this point works for everybody. Works for the Jewish believer who has the word of God and all is revealed to him. That's why they're first. Because the word of God came to the Jewish people first. So because of the light that they had received, because of the, the knowledge that they had of what the will of God was, they're expected to do it first. But then 
everybody else wants to follow suit. So whether you're going to get good stuff or bad stuff, brothers and sisters, it's for the Jewish believer first and then for everybody else. But guess what? Today in the church, it's for the church first and then everybody else. So if they've never heard, that's what it comes down to. And we're going to get into that next week, so I don't want to get there too much. I don't want to, we'll deal with the never heard the gospel thing next week. So it's just, once again, we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about the basis for judgment. Okay? Everybody understand where we're at there? Because we're going to get into Jesus and everything that he did and the salvation. We're going to spend a long time in that. But right now, we just need to understand that. I keep saying it because I don't want whenever uh, someone is listening to this message and I don't want to leave everybody with this feeling that I'm saying that you have to earn your way into heaven. That's not what I'm saying at all. He's just setting down the basis for the judgment that, that God is bringing upon people and the reason why they need help to escape that judgment. He's laying the foundation for the purpose of Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross. So as he lays this foundation down, we need to understand this foundation because it affects the way we deal with the people around us. It affects the way we live our life for him. It affects every aspect of your relationship with God, knowing that the foundation comes in, that we deserve that judgment. We deserve every bit of it. And if we deserve it, the only thing keeping us from it is the grace of God through Jesus Christ. So with that fully understood, with everybody understanding that, it says in that last verse, in verse 11, <clears throat> for God does not show favoritism. It doesn't matter the Jewish people or the Gentile people or whatever, he's just saying that was in degrees based on the revelation that was sent to them. But whenever our push comes to shove, everybody's going to be on one side or the other. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. Nobody's going to ride the fence. Nobody's going to be able to slip through the cracks. Everybody's on one side or the other. There's no favoritism here. The Jewish believer doesn't get into heaven simply because they're Jewish. They get into heaven because they're covered in the blood of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, you do not get into heaven because you've been in a church for four generations. You get into heaven because you, not your grandma, not your mom, because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've been washed in the blood. Amen. Your faith has to be your own. It is not passed down. It's not like a membership to a club someplace that can pass down the family line. It is yours and yours alone. So have you made the connection where you have surrendered your life to Jesus? You are in charge of your own destiny. Everybody wants to get mad and want to rail to God about it, but brothers and sisters, you are in charge of your own destiny. You decide where you're going to go. God has made a way, and he's standing there saying, come to me. And he's waiting. And if you say, you know what? I don't feel like it then you have made a decision about your destiny. You have done that. God will not show any favoritism on that day whenever judgment comes. And that day, whenever it says on that day, there will come a day of judgment. There will come a day when all the grace and all this, this, this um, patience of God, when all of this is going to stop. And he will be like, okay, Here's the deadline. Your decision has been made now. Which side did you land on? Did you choose to follow him or did you choose to follow self? There will come a line that is going to cut all of this off. Brothers and sisters, that's why we say you can't wait till tomorrow because we don't know when that line's going to come. We keep looking at the situations and the circumstances in the world around us right now with what's going on in the Middle East and Israel and Palestine, what's going on in the Ukraine with Russia and the United States getting involved in that, where China's talking about attacking Taiwan and everyone's going World War III, World War III. With all this going on all around us, we don't know if you're going to have tomorrow. You may be perfectly healthy. You may not die in a car accident, but some idiot somewhere may shoot a nuclear missile at somebody. You don't know. And once they push the button, you can't stop it. So there's no need to wait. There's no need to put it off till tomorrow because you may not have it. You may have 100 years or you may have 100 minutes. We do not know what the future holds. 